and welcome back to Tux Theater. We finished afternoon tea of day three. It's getting fewer and fewer talks left on the schedule, but fortunately, we have Lee up next. Um, this let me introduce you to Lee Brunecki. Lee is a software developer and occasional speaker from Adelaide, Australia. She was the conference director of PyCon AU 2020 and co-organized DjangoCon AU 2018 and 2019. She is passionate about API design, cycling, and snacks. Welcome, Lee. Hi. All right. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm standing in a place that has been called Tandanya for centuries before it was called Adelaide. That this was and is a Gauna land, that sovereignty was never ceded, and that for them, tomorrow is not a day of celebration. In this talk, I cite from and talk about the work of others a fair bit. There is a URL on the screen that will take you to a page with links to all of those works. So don't worry about having to scribble things down or search for them afterwards. This is a talk about design. Often when we think about design, we think about websites, mobile apps, book covers and posters. We think about armchairs and shelving systems and calculators and radios. We think of color and shape and maybe material and texture. This is also a talk about APIs, application programming interfaces, the way that two pieces of software interact with each other, whether that's by HTTP requests or function calls. It's also about developer tools, which in the Linux world are mostly CLIs, not strictly APIs, although some CLIs become ad hoc APIs through shell scripting, but designed with the same audience. Those things I mentioned before, the color and shape and so on, they don't really apply to our APIs, which are expressed in plain text. Because of that, it's tempting to think that design doesn't really have much to offer us. But those things are just the applications and the tools of design. Design is about making things for people to use. I said that APIs are for one part of a computer system to interact with another, but that's not quite true. APIs are for people to interact with software by creating more software. Dieter Rams was an influential designer working through the 60s to 80s with Braun, who made far more electronics than just razors back then, as well as Vidso, a furniture company. His armchairs and calculators and such were an inspiration for hardware designers like Apple's Johnny Ive. And it's not hard to come by an analysis of his 10 principles for good design applied to websites or iPhone apps. Those 10 principles are a set of short aphorisms that he wrote in the late 70s, kind of a zen of Python, but for furniturists and stuff. Except, of course, design is more than just furniture and stuff. We're going to see how those principles apply to APIs, those HTTP requests and function calls and so on, which don't have much of a visual aspect at all, which you can't touch or poke at or sit on, but which humans, usually our fellow developers, interact with every day. Good design is innovative. The possibilities for innovation are not by any means exhausted. Technological development is always offering new opportunities for innovative design, but innovative design always develops in tandem with innovative technology and can never be an end in itself. On the web, one of the biggest innovations in API design in recent years has been React. So much of the web today is now React and most of the other libraries that fill a similar purpose are influenced by it by the things it does well and the things those other libraries authors felt would be better done another way. One of those impacts was to do with code organization and to see why we need to go back to the early dynamic web. The web was built on HTML and you had HTML that defined your content and HTML that defined your layout and presentation. Your application logic was all on the server and you'd have your database munging code. Christ, let's pause it for a sec. Oh, I'm back, sweet. <laughs> Uh, mixing with your business logic, perhaps in blocks of PHP code peppered between bits of HTML, and it was all a chaotic mess. Then we started to structure things a bit more deliberately and a bit more formally. We got frameworks that dictated a structure that separated out our logic. We got CSS, which let us separate out our presentation. We started doing more with JavaScript, and it followed the same pattern. Chaotic mess at first, and then we started separating out our code based on what it did, often with client-side frameworks that sort of mirrored the server-side ones. Separation of concerns was everyone's favorite phrase. You had your HTML for structure, your JavaScript for logic, and your CSS for presentation. And React was met with shock and skepticism because it did away with a lot of that. React's code is written in JSX, which is a superset of JavaScript that introduces what is essentially inline HTML expressions. So your structure and your logic get mixed together, and it wasn't long until people started building tools to bring CSS into the mix. So people said, this is going back to the dark old days of pre-framework PHP. What about separation of concerns? But it wasn't. 
It's possible to write messy React code, but uh, React advocates and lends itself to a structure. Your views are made up of lots of small components. You might have one for this button, one for that list, and your components are made up of even more components. Inside each component, you have this mixture of structure and logic, logic and presentation, but that's okay because the components are the unit of, unit of abstraction. So you have a separation of concerns still, it's just separated across a different axis. And for me personally, I find that sort of structure much easier to work with. Generally, when I'm working on a front end, I don't start working on just the HTML and then later switch to just doing presentation with CSS and then later just adding logic with JavaScript. So when you have separation of concerns in that manner, I'm, in reality, I'm jumping between a bunch of layers all at once and I'm finding it difficult to make sure everything is structured in a way that makes sense as I'm going. The other thing I want to talk about is that originally web front end development usually took an imperative approach. You had page structure and your code would grab an element and modify things, add elements and remove them. Then you'd lose track, change something, and the page wouldn't have the structure the code expected and it'd crash. React popularized a more de declarative approach where the entire state of your component is your input and the entire structure is your output. And that's really great because it's much easier to see the bigger picture. You can look at a representation of all the possible states in your code rather than trying to imagine it. And you're less likely to crash your app because it got into a state you weren't anticipating. And there's parallels here to the resurgence of statically typed languages like Rust and Swift. They have new language features like type inference, tagged unions, and pattern matching, which let you write code that keeps all of the safety and checks that a static type system lets you have. Rust in particular has a lot of those, while giving you more expressiveness, expressiveness that can approach dynamically typed languages like Python or JavaScript. The commonality here is that neither of those things are new. React didn't invent declarative UIs. They weren't even the first to do it on the web. Rust didn't invent any of the neat things about its type system. They're quite clear about the fact that a lot of the ideas behind Rust have been around for decades. Both draw heavily from more niche languages, often functional ones, and merge their ideas with more conventional tools. So all in all, there's two lessons here. One is that the way we do things now isn't necessarily the best way to do things. It's worth trying new ideas, and it's worth thinking critically about the things we take for granted. The other is that innovative design doesn't always mean coming up with something from whole cloth. Innovative design can often mean taking something that's been done, some innovative technology that already exists, and designing an API that makes that technology useful. Good design makes a product useful. <laughs> a product is bought to be used. It has to satisfy certain criteria, not only functional, but also psychological and aesthetic. Good design emphasizes the usefulness of a product while disregarding anything that could possibly detract from it. So Rams divides up the criteria he talks about here into three categories. There's functional, and that feels pretty straightforward. That's the things your users want your API to actually do for them. There's aesthetic, which we're going to get onto in more detail later on anyway. And the last one is psychological. When I showed penetration tester and speaker Lily Ryan the quote from Rams that we just saw, her response was about learnability. APIs harm their own usefulness by being hard to navigate, by offering too much or not enough, or by not being set up in a way that makes intuitive sense. When we're writing an API, we know how it works because, well, we're writing it, but we can't beam that knowledge into our users' heads. We also can't do that for the domain knowledge around what our API does. When I use a library to write out Excel files, for instance, I'm doing that because I don't know the inner details of the Office Open XML API, and I don't really want to. Finally, we can't do that for the context we're building our API in. Every time I use a Google API, I feel like I'm reading about and interacting with things that would make so much more sense and feel so much more cohesive if I worked at Google, but I don't. I don't use their tools, their processes, their language and jargon. I'm not privy to their cultural norms and priorities that seem to come through in their APIs so often. The most obvious place to combat this, but definitely not the only place, is in the documentation. In his talk, What Nobody Tells You About Documentation, Daniele Procida divides the docs you provide your API with into four types. Tutorials, how-to guides, discussions, and reference. Tutorials are the hardest to do well, and they're the most important for your API's learnability. Daniela is a former teacher, and his talk is well worth a watch on the topic. I don't think I can do it justice in the short time I have for this topic, but some of the critical parts are providing an immediate sense of achievement, being concrete rather than abstract, avoiding distractions, and giving the minimum necessary explanation. Another way that you can make your API easier to learn is by giving your users less to learn. Progressive disclosure is a concept from user interface design. It's about revealing complexity as you go, if and when it becomes relevant, rather than all at once right at the start. 
The specific case that comes to mind is a bit of a double-edged sword, and we'll talk about why that is later. But the Django Object Relational Mapper does this pretty well. Simple queries are really simple. You don't need to know about the gnarly details of how the ORM constructs queries or talks to the database when you do to do your first query. But when you eventually do need to do more, there is a progressive, supported, and documented path that allows you to gradually dive in deeper. There are libraries that take this a bit further. Requests and Flask are two Python libraries, a HTTP client and server, respectively. They're high level and relatively simple and easy to pick up. Uh, and they both wrap URLib3 and Workazoid, which are low level nuts and bolts libraries for when you want to do something more complicated. The last thing to be mindful of is the context that your users are using your APIs in, which brings us back to Google. When I'm writing web front-end code, I'm usually writing in TypeScript, installing things via NPM, and packaging up my code with one of the more modern bundlers that are designed to interoperate with each other and the commonly accepted norms of the rest of the ecosystem, like Webpack or Parcel. Google, they're in their own little world of front-end tooling. They have their own dynamic script loader thing that you have to load, and then you tell it to go fetch the library you actually want, and then it calls a callback that you register to let it know the library's ready, that it's deposited its API into a particular predefined space in the global sp scope, and... <laughs> That's probably the norm inside Google. It certainly seems to be how a lot of Google's public-facing APIs expect you to use them, at least. But for me, I've got this module system and this build tool chain and this module loader that works with my code, that works with every other kind of third-party code I want to use. But if I want to use a Google library, I have to figure out how to get all of this weird Google stuff to work with my tools. And this goes through their documentation, too. It's been long enough that I can't remember details, but I've more than once been tripped up by Weird little Googleisms, unexpected details you need to know to make their API work or make a particular endpoint work, but that's hidden in some footnote far away from the reference for that endpoint. And it also just feels like the sort of thing that you'd just know if you worked at Google or you spent every day coding against Google APIs. And it's worth noting this doesn't have to be organizational either. If you're building an API for Excel documents, be wary about omitting things that seem obvious if you have familiarity with Excel. If you're building a web API, but you come from a Unix background, watch out for details that might not come naturally to most people who develop on Windows. So one of the things that makes an API useful is learnability. And to accomplish that, the key is to understand the users of your API, what they know, what they might not, and what they really shouldn't be expected to at all. Progressive Disclosure is a really useful tool to help ease users into our APIs. Good design is aesthetic. The aesthetic quality of a product is integral to its usefulness because products we use every day affect our person and our well-being, but only well-executed objects can be beautiful. This one's really interesting to me because code isn't just plain text. There's not a lot of flexibility or control over what it looks like, but we absolutely have a sense of aesthetics when it comes to code. The Powerhouse Museum has a long-running exhibition about information technology design. It's called Interface, and it appears to still be there. So if you're in Sydney, check it out. It has a few objects designed by Rams, as well as some designed by Apple's Johnny Ive, and you can see the resemblance. You can see the flow of inspiration and the shared values of priorities. What really struck me, though, was a contrast. In the work of Rams and Ive, you can see the sort of refined, minimalist utilitarianism. Everything is deliberate and precise and quiet. There's lots of muted whites and, whites and greys and silvers. It's all very refined and serious and German. And the exhibition also has some typewriters and calculators made by Olivetti, most of them designed by Mario Bellini. And I absolutely adored those. They were lovely and beautiful and totally different. They had lots of round, curved edges, lots of bold colours, bright yellows, glossy reds, and they were all very loud and very fun and very very Italian. You can see that there's these two different sort of families of industrial design, and at the risk of irking design historians, I'm going to call them German and Italian design. Each of them is a kind of value system with different priorities, the utilitarianism of the Germans making finely crafted tools, while the Italians saw themselves as artists striving to create an emotional reaction of a user of a calculator. And so it is with code. Different languages, different ecosystems, different programming communities all have these different sets of shared ideas about what good code looks like, these shared and intertwined aesthetics and value systems. Thinking about good design is aesthetic in the context of APIs, to me that's about writing what we often call idiomatic code, writing an API that fits in with the value system of the people using it and the code around it. Python talks about this so much that it has its own term for the concept. Idiomatic code in Python is called Pythonic. Superficially, that means using underscores instead of camel case, but it goes deeper than that. <coughs> Excuse me while I swallow my water. 
<laughs> in Christopher Neugebauer's talk, Fabulous Blocks and Where to Hide Them, among other things, he talks about how Python has resisted adding anonymous code blocks of the sort that Ruby has, instead preferring to introduce custom syntax for particular use cases. From a language design perspective, it's Pythonic to build out these custom syntaxes, things like context managers, iterators, and the async and await keywords. From an API design perspective, to fit into that value system, use those things. If you have a resource that opens and closes, make it a context manager. If you have something that's conceptually an ordered collection, implement the iterator protocol so it can be looped over. For Ruby, you might instead implement an each method that takes a block following the norms of that language. If you're immersed in that value system, you really start to notice when you use an API that violates that sort of thing. An API that doesn't fit in with the aesthetics of its surroundings, with the norms of the ecosystem it's in. Oh, and those norms, they're shortcuts too. If your users can use your API just like every other API that they're used to, they don't have to remember extra details about how your API works. Even better, they might not even have to learn them or look them up. If they have enough confidence that your API behaves exactly how they expect, they might even just try applying those norms to your code and go, ah, oh, sweet, that works. On the flip side, if you're not immersed in the ecosystem, you might miss the subtle details. You might end up with an API that violates your users' expectations in subtle ways. There's no real way to understand the norms of the ecosystem you're building for with a book or a checklist. You really have to be part of it, interact with it, seek feedback and collaboration from others within it. So every ecosystem where your API is going to get used, there's these shared values and norms, and understanding them is key to understanding how the users of your API are going to feel when they use it. Good design makes a product understandable. It clarifies the product structure. Better still, it can make the product talk. At best, it is self-explanatory. And this almost seems like it was written with code in mind, especially self-explanatory. That's such a common goal so frequently missed that self-documenting code is kind of a shared running joke. To say that unironically of code that you've just written is a dangerous game of tempting fate. Of course, when we talk about what makes a product useful, we talked about learnability, and that could just as easily fit here. But to me, this is about naming things. And Git, Git is kind of a counterexample of this. It has a bunch of different names for the same thing. It has a stage, a staging area, and an index. They're all terms for the same thing, and you'll see all of them throughout the documentation and resources. Putting files in the stage is called staging them, so the command used that used to do that is called add. And there's no remove to unstage. You run git reset dash dash soft, or maybe git reset head with head and all. I, have, I always have to look it up. <laughs> there's different commands with similar names like revert, reset, and restore. There's commands that do multiple seemingly unrelated things. Checkout can be used to switch between two branches or to restore individual files from history. Those two functions have recently been kind of separated out into switch and restore. Checkout is still there. Those things were combined into one command originally, because under the hood, they're very similar operations. And Git justifies a lot of things that way, and they're all kind of a cop-out. Git has this rather nice data model where everything is a directed acyclic graph, and the closer you get to understanding every minute detail, the more it makes sense. But there's no good reason for it to be that way. Switch and restore don't compromise the ideological purity of Git's data model. They just make it easier to use without having that context. We talked about progressive disclosure earlier, and this is relevant here too. Whatever the opposite of progressive... Prof let me try that again. Whatever the opposite of progressive disclosure is, Git is that thing. Git shoves your inner workings, Git shoves its inner workings in your face at every possible opportunity. Anyway, as much fun as it is to rag on Git, I am going to now talk about how my own code is, is so much better. <laughs> I, I mean, I am. I have, so I have a project called BridgeKeeper. It's an access control library for Django that does some clever filtering stuff uh, that nothing else at the time could do. And the initial ideas for how BridgeKeeper would work and how you'd use it were formed around concepts from mathematical logic. In BridgeKeeper, you have these predicates, which are small, simple objects that know how to check one thing. Like, does a field have a certain value? Or does the user have a certain role? And you combine them together with and, or, or not. If you've never taken a discrete maths class, and many software developers haven't, you might not recognize the word predicate, or you might have heard it, but not be completely sure exactly what it means. But honestly, you don't need to be, and so I got rid of the name. I asked some people, I thought about some alternatives, how intuitive they were, whether they had alternate meanings that could mislead or confuse, and now predicates are called rules, and the whole thing is much more understandable. There's a discussion here to be had about Git and the contempt culture in the Linux community it grew out of that encourages interfaces like the one that it's had for many years. But the biggest difference between Git and my project is nobody uses mine. I've tested its API learnability by using junior developers where I wrote it, uh, doing what UI designers call hallway testing, informal testing, which is uh, done with whoever's nearby. Since I left that job, I've got feedback from other developers, made plans, but it's still not at 1.0. And that means I have a chance. <laughs> 
I can make big sweeping changes and I can make them easily. When you're building a new API, when it's starting to look like it's getting there, but you're not making stability promises yet, that's an opportunity. Think about all of the names you use. Think about if they make sense, what context people need to understand them. Think if they'll have other meanings to other people and think about changing them. And whether you change them or not, go through everything, your API, docs, example code, and make all of your terminology consistent. Rein in your design and give it clarity and cohesion. If you're already big, you can do this, but it's much harder. Git will probably always limit itself to changes that are small, incremental, and mostly additive. Huge, sweeping, replace the universe changes to widely used projects can be done, but ask any Python core developer from the last 20 years how stressful they are. I'm going to let my lungs recover from the first, what, 20 minutes or so? <laughs> Good design is unobtrusive. Products fulfilling a purpose are like tools. They are neither decorative objects, maybe Rams are throwing some shade at the Italians there, nor are they works of art. Their design should be therefore both neutral and restrained to leave room for the user's self-expression. I'm fairly certain he's throwing shade at the Italians. At a previous job, we needed to set up an online store and I ended up writing an online store library on top of Django from scratch. I was delighted to do it, but my work only let me because of a weird constraint. Because of some uh, creative ideas they had around fulfillment, they only wanted users to be able to check out when the number of things in their cart was a multiple of three. So we investigated and poked at a bunch of different libraries and they fell into two camps. Some set out to be simple. They followed the principle of building the 10% of features the 90% of users want. They were easy to set up, easy to use. So if, you want, if, you, if what you needed was what they had in mind, they were perfect but they didn't have a way to restrict checkout unless the items in your cart were a multiple of three because it turns out that's not what 90% of users want for some reason. Others set out to do all things for all people. They were incredibly complex with database tables as far as the eye can see and a checkbox for everything. They felt like they could be described as enterprise or at least enterprisey. You could do anything you wanted with them if you could figure out how. And we had this multiple of three requirement and we couldn't figure out how. To this day, I'm still not sure if the candidates we looked at in this category legitimately didn't have a way to do it, or if we just couldn't find a way to do it under the sheer volume of other stuff they could do. So I got the green light to build what would become Lorikeet. Lorikeet doesn't sit in either camp, instead it gives you a bunch of components and a bunch of slots to fit them into. You implement a cart item. If it's simple, you can copy and paste about three lines from the example code, but if it's more complex, you can model exactly what you need. You set up a delivery address model. If you're shipping to physical addresses, you can just use the one that's built in, or you can write your own if you're doing something different. Likewise for payment methods. Lorikeet had some default cart checkers, which did things like making sure you couldn't pay unless you had a delivery address set, but you could replace that with your own. Perhaps you had a combination of physical and digital goods and only wanted to require a delivery address in some cases. Perhaps you had a weird constraint about the cart being a multiple of three. And we had another project in the pipeline, another online shop, but it was internal facing for IT equipment. You'd order something, you'd charge it to your department's internal budget instead of a credit card. And depending on what it was, it'd be delivered to one of the company's sites through the internal courier network the company had, or IT would come and install it for you. We never got to build that, but when that idea was floated, it really validated Lorikeet's design. We could have just swapped out the payment method and delivery address with our own, rather than trying to shoehorn them into a system that, we assumed, that assumed we were sending things in the post. The inspiration for this design came from the world of content management systems in Django at the time. There was Django CMS, the all, all, all things for all people option that was made of object relational spaghetti. There was Mezzanine, which did the 10% of things for the 90% of people. And then there was Wagtail, which inspired Lorikeet, possibly subconsciously including the name. Django CMS and Mezzanine both worked out of the box without writing a line of Python and Wagtail didn't. Wagtail assumed you knew some Python and Django and made you do a little bit of coding to set up your page types. It had a few different places you could fit things and it had a few pre-built things you could snap into those places or you can make your own when you needed to. Django CMS and Mezzanine were products with an API but Wagtail was an API and that gave it the freedom to sidestep both Mezzanine's limitations and Django CMS's complexity. And one of the critical things about Wagtail and its snap together API that Lorikeet mimics is that there's a few places you can snap in components and a handful of components that snap into them. By using the snap together architecture, but also using restraint with the number of moving parts, you can make an API that enables your users to build what they want rather than getting in the way. <sighs> 
Good design is honest. It does not make a product more innovative, powerful, or valuable than it really is. It does not attempt to manipulate the consumer with promises that cannot be kept. And if we were talking about web design in this section, we'd probably be talking about dark patterns. Design patterns with the intent to trick or mislead the user, like tiny checked by default checkboxes to sign up to a newsletter or the myriad of tricks those cookie consent popovers use to make it difficult to click anything except accept all. Now, when I was writing this talk, I struggled to think of an API analog. And while some people suggested a few good examples, and if you have more, I'd love to hear them afterwards on Twitter or the chat or the Fediverse, I couldn't find a common thread to string through them. There is another pattern though, and although it doesn't have the same intent to mislead, it's still a path that leads to sharp corners. Whenever we're writing an API for something, we're usually in the business of abstraction, of simplification. Some APIs go further. Some APIs construct a facade. They try to make the thing it's encapsulate in they try to make the thing they're encapsulating into something it isn't. Orms, object relational mappers, are a prime example of this. Benno Rice describes to me the role of an orm as constructively lying to you. When you use an orm, you interact with your data as if it's a graph of objects connected to each other, and you can traverse these relationships in an ad hoc way as if they're just there. But that's not really the case. In reality, your data is sort of structured like that, in tuples and a handful of relations within a relational database with foreign keys sort of linking them. But that's where the similarities end. The way you query your relational database is wildly different to the API and ORM exposes. When you query a relational database, you ask it to construct more relations and it assembles and returns to you this rectangular structure with rows and columns. And all of this is happening far away. Unless you're using SQLite, the data is in a different process. It's often in an entirely different machine. ORMs have to do a lot behind the scenes. As your application runs, they're fastidiously at work, translating your queries into SQL and then separating out the rectangular result into these objects that it constructs and links together, constructing this graph that it presents to you as it goes. It's laying down track ahead of the train like Gromit and trying to make it seem as though it was there all along. And they work. For simple cases at low load, everything is fine. But that constructive lie is the root of a lot of sharp corners. More complex queries often end up being harder to write in an ORM than they are in SQL. Usually you need to understand the SQL you want to generate, how that works, what the performance characteristics of that are, and you need to understand enough of the innards of the ORM to make it produce the SQL that you want. It's very rare you can do complex querying entirely at the ORM's abstraction level without thinking about the SQL underneath. Then, once you've sent off your query and got your results set, there's even more sharp corners, and most of them revolve around the facade that all of your data is right there when it's not. There's a really common trap you can fall into, so common it has a name, the n plus one problem, and it looks like this. What you can't see, what the ORM is lying to you about, is that author is not really there. When you access the author attribute, the ORM goes and fires off an entirely new request, doing a whole bunch of network IO, constructs an author object out of the response and pretends it was there all along. And because you're doing that in a loop over and over again, it slows things down. And the solution is to tell the ORM in advance what you're going to do with it. So you have this API that's lying to you to try and make it simpler, but in order to get acceptable performance, you have to know about the lie and know about the circumstances when it's lying and code around it. This same feature is one that's called he caused headaches for people building the libraries as well. Andrew Godwin uh, has for a few years now been part of the effort to move Django into the world of asynchronous IO. Python's async IO syntax is really quite explicit about when it yields control. So this model of the ORM might hit the network at surprising times, doesn't really lend itself to async. So what I get from all of this is use caution when simplifying things. Are you simplifying or are you constructing a facade? How complex is it? How surprising is its behavior? Do your users have a way to pop the hood, an easy and supported way to use the lower level for stuff if your facade causes problems? Good design is long lasting. It avoids being fashionable and therefore never appears antiquated. Unlike fashionable design, it lasts many years, even in today's throwaway society. And this one is interesting because it feels like it shouldn't apply to software, but at the same time, it's pretty clear it absolutely does. And the thing that jumped to my head with this one at first was a counterexample, the JavaScript ecosystem. The tools du jour in the JavaScript world change and get replaced at an eye-watering ra rate. But if you step back, the web itself that's a long-lasting design. The web was created a few years before I was born, and here I am. I have a career that's largely been building things for it, and I'm here for, uh, for a substantial part talking about it. So what is it that makes the web long-lasting? I think the big difference is that it's not a piece of software. Nobody sits down in front of their next cube and opens up World Wide Web anymore. 
The things that last in our industry are protocol standards, things that multiple implementers have agreed upon. HTTP, HTML, JavaScript wouldn't have their ubiquity if they were a proprietary system. But they also need to evolve. And the web is kind of lucky on this one. Some time ago, when I first started in web development, Internet Explorer 6 had won the browser wars. Web standards grew stagnant, and then Firefox came along and it presented a compelling alternative. It let web developers do more by pushing the standards forward. It let web users do more with features like tabbed browsing. It had the backing of Google. The dominance of IE6 wasn't in their interest, and Chrome didn't exist yet. So Firefox got their financial support, and occasionally ad space on the most visited page in the entire web. We've been less lucky with chat. There's some market forces at play here too, which ties probably more into Corey's keynote on Saturday than into this talk. But IRC has been stagnant for a while. It has everything that you need if you still live in the terminal. Meanwhile, proprietary chat platforms have been adding formatting and inline embeds and emoji reactions. I don't know if it's still like this, but last time I went on IRC, there were some servers around the place where if you posted anything that included characters outside of ASCII, you'd get yelled at because other people's clients didn't support it and that was your fault. <laughs> and in the meantime, the closed source vendors are churning out walled gardens of disposable software and now hardware. There's so many examples of IoT systems where the vendor has gone bust and then you have an expensive paperweight. I'm currently illuminated by a big halogen lamp that's doing battle with my air conditioner and winning. Um, but when I'm not presenting, this house is lit up by LifeX lights because they can be controlled by an openly documented API that doesn't involve traffic leaving my LAN. It's not quite the multi-vendor interoperability that I'd like to see, but it does mean I can switch my lights on without some Melbourne startup's blessing. There's probably a lot more that can be said about uh, long-lasting technology, but to me it feels like durability is two things, openness and evolution. Good design is thorough down to the last detail. Nothing must be arbitrary or left to chance. Care and urge, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's an irony in me messing up the word accuracy. That was, that was, all right. Care and accuracy, which I have now said accurately, in the design process, show respect towards the user. And there's so many counter examples to this. The worst offenders though, they're the auto-generated wrappers. Things like a Python library that's auto-generated from a web API or auto-generated C bindings. The AWS CLI is really bad for this. I'm not sure exactly how the units of the CLI are structured, but large parts of it seem to be auto-generated from the web API. Like many auto-generated wrappers, it's a wrapper that's so thin you can see right through it. Half the time it just spits out JSON at you, often not even formatted nicely so that you can read it easily. Sometimes you have to pass parameters as JSON2 and then make sure that your JSON is not just syntactically correct but also escapes properly so that your shell won't eat the quote symbols. There's also this weird mismatch between how you expect to call a web API and how you expect a CLI to work. AWS CloudFormation has a separate API endpoint to create a new stack and update a stack. And for a web API, that makes sense. On a CLI though, it's much more common to have a command that updates a resource if it exists and creates it if it doesn't. And that just feels weird not to have that. In an API, you wouldn't expect a long, in a web API rather, you wouldn't expect a long running task to block. You'd expect to tart it off, get a response that says it started, and then have a mechanism to check to see how it's going, or maybe you get notified at the end. And that's exactly how CloudFormation deployments work in the CLI. You run a deployment, the command finishes, it returns zero to indicate success, and that means the deployment has been queued, which is a little weirder in a CLI. To their credit, AWS have since addressed these issues with a new command they suspect was written by hand. And auto-generated wrappers often just feel wrong. In other cases, they might not use native types. Exposing date times as strings or numbers rather than date objects, or returning handlers that get passed to functions where you might expect to see an object with methods. They often don't think fit into the aesthetic of the ecosystem that they're in. They're great as a starting point to save you some tedious parts of writing a wrapper, but there's something that's they're like something rather that's come out of a 3D printer. You need to spend a lot of time hand polishing or it's just janky. And my camera's gone again, but I'm going to keep talking. Oh, it's back. Lovely. So we know that auto-generated APIs tend not to be terribly thorough. Not just exposing that is a good start. But what makes an API really thorough? The most thorough graphical user interfaces that I encounter and the most thoroughly designed physical objects, they all have a good amount of polish and finesse through every path you might take in using them, not just the most common one. You'll find in frequently used corners that have some lovely, well thought, thought, blah, 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 thought out detail. Or you won't even notice because the design is so unobtrusive that it never even occurs to you that you're treading an uncommon path. And the same is true of APIs, and that really shines through when it comes to errors.
There are plenty of APIs where the happy path is lovely and well thought through, but if anything goes wrong, it's a lot less clear how to handle it. A thorough API will tell you in the documentation what sort of errors might occur at different places and point you in the right direction to handle them. A thorough API, when you hit those errors, will have good error messages. Rust's compiler is really good at this. When you hit a compile time error at Rust, the, error, the compiler has this lovely clear error message. It tells you where it found the error, what it was expecting, what it got instead. It might even give you a hint of what it thinks it might have, you might have done wrong or some links to some documentation. And in many cases, what it gives you is enough to solve it even if you've never hit it before. And it's certainly enough to find, save you a lot of time in finding the solution compared to just an error number. React's approach to this is interesting. Production builds of React try to minimize code size because when you use React on your website, every visitor has to download all of React. So they don't have these big long error messages, they have error codes. And this is probably one of the few cases where it still makes sense to use error codes in this day of age and the other is on microcontrollers. But in React, the error code gets embedded into your URL and you get a clickable link in the debug console. You visit that link and that's where you get all of the detail. You get a nice error message, a description of what the error means, means some common courses for that error and advice on where to look and links to learn more. And that's a really neat approach I'd love to see more of. Even outside of web front ends, most terminal emulators let you command click on something uh, that's a URL to open it these days. There are other cases where it really shows that an API is well thought through, where it shows that an API has polished out the corner cases, is when that API enables you to polish out the corner cases in your own work. Error handling is an example of this too, but so is accessibility. Accessibility features tend to be less well-trodden paths and collectively a decent amount of us probably use one or the other, but individually they're relatively rarely used. I use an enlarged mouse pointer. Basically every app and website I use that's not made by Apple and doesn't use a default cursor, I get a pixelated cursor. And I'm not an iOS developer, but one thing I do I hear from people that are is that iOS APIs make it easy to make apps accessible. And another thing I hear a lot is that not only just iOS, but the ecosystem of third party apps on the platform is much better for accessibility than other mobile platforms. That's probably not a coincidence. Good design is environmentally friendly. Design makes an important contribution to the preservation of the environment. It conserves resources and minimizes physical and visual pollution throughout the life cycle of the product. And I honestly would have thought that one of the most impactful things we can do to make our code more environmentally friendly is to write code that does less, that's more efficient and uses less power. But it turns out that's not quite true. Marin McLeod gave a talk on, at PyCon AU 2019 called Environment Variables about our industry's impact on climate change, positive and negative, and also cheese. In that talk, she points out that just reducing the amount of power our code uses is probably not as impactful as other things we could do, partly because if we can do a thing with less resources, we often end up doing it more because capitalism. That might not hold true for you, for the tool or the library you're building, and for the way your users use it. It might be that you know something about your niche that doesn't necessarily generalize, but gives you confidence that energy consumption wins you make aren't just going to result in an increase in volume. Or it might be your tool is many layers away from the final product in the abstraction and it's broad in scope. If you're writing an SVG parser, there's probably not a lot of things you can say with confidence about the business priorities of not only your users, but their users. But there are other ways technology can help. Technology can enable us to travel yet less like this year, but the thing that jumped out to me was that not all energy is created equal. And electricity in Sydney is a lot dirtier than Oregon. So if you can do your latency sensitive stuff in Sydney and move background processing offshore, you can reduce your climate that impact that way. So that's a question to ask yourself when you're designing an API for a library. Are your users likely to have opportunities to do that sort of work shifting? And do you have an opportunity to design your API to make that easy? Is there a way you can structure your library to make it simple to do different types of compute in different machines on different continents? And that doesn't get you all the way there. Just because your users can doesn't mean they will. There is a way we can push in the right direction and that's by doing something else that Marin also mentions, mentions at the end of her talk. A talk about climate impact, normalize having those discussions and we can do that through documentation. If you have the ability to code split, highlight that it's there and use the climate impact use case as an example. You don't have to make a song and dance about it, just having that consideration there can be part of making climate impact an everyday consideration for people designing software. Good design is as little design as possible, less but better because it concentrates on the essential aspects and the products are not burdened with non-essentials. Back to purity, back to simplicity.
this is something that translates really well to API design. And I'm quite pleased that it's last because it's something that to me is really quite important and that I think about a lot when designing APIs. The way that I like to think about it is what I call cognitive overhead. Nothing is infinite. The machines that run our software have limited resources. So to varying degrees, we optimize how much of those resources we use. We might try to run, write code that runs faster, uses less RAM, writes less to disk, communicates less over the network, or uses less battery. And we use a bunch of different tricks for that. If we can avoid doing something entirely, we will. You look for opportunities to use the same resource more than, for more than one thing if we can. We might defer things to run later, maybe something that might not be needed at all, or maybe there's 20 components we need eventually, but not all at the same time. Or we might pre-compute things that we know or think we might need later if we've got more free resources earlier on. Nothing is infinite, and that applies to developers too. There's a limited amount of things we can remember, and there's an even more limited amount of ideas and concepts and facts that we can keep in our working memory at any given time. There's a limited amount of hours in the day and limited amount of time before we have to have made progress both towards whatever we're building. And it might seem kind of trite to say the human brain is just like a computer, but when you start to think about API design in this way, you notice that optimizing your API design for cognitive overhead is pretty similar to optimizing your code to run faster. The solutions sound similar in an abstract sense, and you definitely end up using the same sort of creative problem solving that you might use to optimize something else. You might try to use fewer concepts so that your users don't have to swap things in and out of their working memory. You might design your API to only use certain concepts in certain places so that they only have to hold those things in their working memory when they're working in those parts of the system. You might reuse concepts and patterns for the tools you're building on top of, like languages and frameworks. BridgeKeeper I talked about earlier, there's a ch uh, change that I haven't merged yet that changes a lot of the, sy um, the syntax of, the, um, of how rules are built up so that it behaves a lot more like a lot of parts of Django's own API. And everyone I've, told, I've shown it to has told me it's much easier to understand and work with because they're already familiar with that sort of syntax. And it does feel weird talking about APIs as being for people. And I think that's because we have this divide in how we think about people. We have the users, the commoners who know nothing and need help in understanding computing. We have the developers, the smarter superior class who know everything already. It feels weird because of contempt culture, because of the superiority, com superiority complex we have as developers. And so we think we don't need design. We think about the people that use our APIs and we think, oh, they're developers. They know computers, so they don't need help. They'll already know this. Or perhaps we don't think about the people that use our APIs. Perhaps we think about code as something we're building for the computer. The thing is though, unless you're directly fiddling with binaries in a hex editor, there's layers of abstraction between what you write and what the computer runs. But computers are dumb machines that are good at doing simple things very fast. They don't need abstractions. The abstractions are for humans. The code we write is mostly for humans. My name is Lee Brunecki. I'm gonna take questions if we have time, but I'm not gonna take comments on stream even if they're phrases questions. Uh, if you have comments, feedback, or wanna say hi, chat to me in Venulus afterwards or get in touch, there's contact details on the screen. I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, because this is a for questions to come up. I do wanna thank Lily and Benno for helping me get past writer's block and suggesting directions I wouldn't have thought of on my own. And I'm gonna fix my strap for the 11th time. I don't actually know, I didn't keep, keep count. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee, Thank for you. that exciting, fast-paced, and very it useful talk. It wasn't meant to be that fast, and then I kept writing, well, and there was more content. There's and, only oh, two this. minutes left, so oh, it's a good thing might. it was that fast, so we managed to learn <laughs> that much from you. Do we have okay. time for like a question or something? I will, I will give you a question. There All are right. more, but I will give you a question. Okay. Here is a question. Are there any APIs that you feel follow all 10 principles? Oh, I don't know. That, that's all I have for that one. Okay, cool. <laughs> we'll fit in another one. Cool. Scroll through the off topic questions, which are good questions. You can answer them later in chat. I will, um, probably. We'll you see. talked about Git overexposing the underlying model, but on mm -hmm. the other hand, about ORM lying with a virtual model. How mm -hmm. does the API designer resolve the tension here? Um, with difficulty. It's one of those things where if, if there's a sort of nice, simple, general answer that I can give in 56 seconds, I haven't found it yet. Um, it's one of those things where it, it, you have to sort of think about your individual use case and also, just test. Like, I briefly mentioned hallway testing, which is a thing you can do with APIs. If you have a developer nearby that has 
the the background that you'd expect the different the users of your API to have, and you know, but they weren't involved in building whatever you're building, just give them the tutorial, get them just say, go through this and let me know if you get stuck anywhere, or sort of watch them go through and watch them build something and see where they get stuck. All right, I think we are out of time. Um, so everyone, if you have further questions for Lee or you want to keep the conversation going, head over to the Tux Theater post talk. I'm forgetting all of my words now. Uh, Q&A really channel. Really it's in Venulus <laughs> in the sidebar on the left-hand side. If you haven't found it before, look in the sidebar. Look for the Browse All Channels button, Tux Theater post talk Q&A channel. Okay, I'll paste in the questions that we didn't get time to answer in here. Sweet. And thank you again for um, such an impressive talk, Lee. We enjoyed thank it you. very much. Thank you so much, Betsy. And thank you, everyone that, that watched as well. <laughs>